Robot Talk is the podcast that sits down with robot enthusiasts from around the world and asks them the questions you always wanted answered. Like, can I have an exosuit to make me stronger? And how does that thing work? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Robot Talk. I'm your host, Claire Asher, and this week... I'm exploring the exciting field of wearable robotics. From state-of-the-art robotic prostheses to exoskeletons that can provide support and reduce injury. Before that, I'd like to remind you that you can send in your questions for my future guests, either by contacting us on social media, we're at robottalkpod on all the socials, or you can submit questions via our website by going to robottalk.org. And don't forget to enter our competition for a chance to win your very own Robot Talk t-shirt. For more information about the competition and how to enter, check out robottalk.org. So, with all that said, it's time for me to introduce this week's guest. I recently had a great discussion with Josh Caputo from Humotech, all about robotic prostheses, exoskeletons and prototyping. This week, I'm speaking to Josh Caputo, President and CEO at Humotech, a company providing a platform to support research and development of prostheses, exoskeletons, and other wearable machines. Hi, Josh. Great to have you on Robot Talk. Hi, Claire. Thanks so much for having me. So you began your career as an engineer working in the Experimental Biomechatronics Laboratory at Carnegie Mellon University, where you worked on a robotic foot and ankle prosthetic. So can you describe what the prosthetic looks like and and how it works? Sure thing. Um, So the prosthetic foot emulator, as we commonly refer to it as, operates like a conventional prosthetic foot, um, Mm -hmm. but it looks quite different um, and has some advanced capabilities, which I'm happy to explain. Okay. Um, so uh, typically, we have worked with uh, unilateral transtibial uh, amputees. Uh, so these are people who use a prosthetic foot and ankle that attaches below the knee. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the prosthetic foot emulator uh, attaches in the same manner to a conventional prosthetic foot, but it is programmable. Okay. Uh, so while the person is walking, typically on a treadmill, uh, we can in real time adjust the mechanical function uh, of the foot through a software interface. And uh, critical to this approach is an off-board actuation and control system. So unlike a traditional prosthetic foot, uh, our system has uh, these cables that uh, extend uh, beyond the foot uh, to off-board modules. That includes motors, computers, uh, and the software. Mm, okay. So through the software, we program, uh, well, we can program all sorts of things. Um, there's sort of two paradigms. One where our collaborators together with our internal uh, R&D team are exploring sort of new frontiers for prosthetics, uh, mm. experimenting with different sensors, different control algorithms, um, different approaches that might be commercializable uh, at some point, but are not yet standard practice. And then in the other paradigm, we use the emulator uh, as a tool to mimic currently available uh, prosthetic technologies and provide patients with an opportunity to rapidly test drive uh, different options. So sort of like going into a shoe store and being able to quickly try on different shoes, Mm -hmm. uh, we envision being able to go into a prosthetic clinic and with the emulator technology, being able to quickly try on uh, different prosthetics. Okay. So yeah, I guess the the word emulator is key here. So like in the same way that a pilot might use a a flight emulator to learn how to do different maneuvers, it's a kind of a similar concept for testing out new approaches to prosthetics. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good observation. Um, you know, it's similar with autonomous driving. You know, these cars are doing many miles in simulation before they do it on the real roads. Um, this, this is actually a pretty common idea in other industries, yeah. uh, but it's a very new idea to prosthetics uh, and exoskeletons. And I think the reason that um, it's taken some time to realize this idea, um, and this is what makes Humotech unique, is that you can't accurately simulate a human walking uh, mm. with a prosthesis or exoskeleton. We're just not there yet in our mathematical models of human biomechanics to be able to accurately predict purely in software uh, you know, how a person is going to respond uh, to a given piece of technology. So that's why we devised emulation, where we're kind of blending. You know, Some of the work is done in software, uh, but a lot of it is real physical interactions between the human and the, and the machine. Mm. Um, so that emulation for us uh, means that we can rapidly iterate on the mechanics of the device in the software. That's the programming of the robot. But then we actually need to take the time to see how a real human interacts with those mechanics while they walk. And we have to actually measure their response mm. um, to, to make an accurate uh, measurement. Yeah. Uh, someday. Uh, all this data that we're generating could potentially be used to build a pure simulation model. Okay. Um, and you wouldn't need the emulator anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but we think that's several years down the road. Okay. I, I thought you were going to say much longer than that, but um, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm bullish on all this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in 2015, you founded Humotech um, to support the commercialization of this emulator. Um, what has been your experience of going from the lab to the real world, as it were? Sure. Well, uh, it's been fun uh, and a little crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> as any tech entrepreneur, I, I think, can attest to. Um, so I was working at my PhD at Carnegie Mellon in mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've always had an entrepreneurial bent, but what really uh, inspired me to start the company was, you know, starting to build relationships with colleagues where they were coming to me and saying, you know, what would it take for you to build us one of these systems uh, so we could use it in our lab? Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I was starting to line up customers. Um, and that, that really motivated me to take the leap and, and found the company, uh, and hurry up and finish my PhD. <laughs> um, so, uh, since then, um, well, it's a broad question. I mean, we've, so we've been in business for eight years now. Um, we have built over 30 systems, uh, deployed them across the U S Canada and Europe. Um, and our customers are doing all sorts of crazy cool things uh, with the system. Um, it's, it's quite a wide breadth. Um, our focus in the beginning was uh, definitely on, on prosthetic feet, uh, also ankle foot orthoses, basically ankle exoskeletons. Mm. Um, so we were very focused on the ankles, um, but we have since uh, expanded in a few interesting directions. We have a hip exoskeleton, um, one of our customers developed a back exoskeleton. Uh, there's just all sorts of uh, applications uh, that, that we're exploring um, with really the vision to proliferate this platform, uh, you know, worldwide for anybody doing uh, research and development in wearable uh, machines. And um, the other kind of big uh, pillar of our work has been uh, developing some specific healthcare or clinical applications. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, on one hand, we're trying to proliferate this general purpose platform. On the other hand, uh, we have a very specific use case uh, that we've been driving towards, uh, and, it, and it's in healthcare. Um, so since our founding, uh, we have conducted uh, several clinical trials uh, together with the Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs. Uh, the first trial has completed, and we've been publishing results from that 
uh, trial. And we've kicked off uh, three kind of follow on trials, um, kind of expanding the idea in different directions. Um, so the basic idea there is what I alluded to earlier, you know, patients being able to test drive mm -hmm. uh, prosthetic feet in the clinic. Um, and we're looking at applying this for ankle foot orthoses and other devices as well. So that is currently in the stage of, you know, I think we've demonstrated the validity of the approach. Uh, it works. You know, patients are, are excited about it. Clinicians are excited about it. Our next big hurdle is is FDA approval. Mm. Um, so we're beginning that that process now. Sure. Yeah. The uh, the regulatory side of things is always is always challenging. I think from what what I've heard from other guests. Yeah, and that's why we've really taken a diversified approach. So we're developing uh, clinical applications that we're really passionate about, um, and we're working with the DoD and and Veterans Affairs and. Uh, different federal agencies, uh, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of <laughs> protocol, a lot of regulatory considerations, but it's, you know, it's worth it because we're really trying to revolutionize this field. Um, on the other hand, we're also working in, you know, sort of non-healthcare applications where things do move faster. Mm -hmm. um, it it tends to be a little bit more, uh, you know, kind of wild west. <laughs> it, it, and a lot of the applications are really exciting, but uh, emerging. Um, you know, it's, it's unclear if it'll really take off. Mm. In prosthetics and orthotics, like there is a population of people who absolutely need this technology for their daily life. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the customer is sort of obvious. And the work is in proving that we can better serve that customer uh, in a new way. Um, for the non-healthcare applications, it's it's not so obvious that the customer exists, um, but uh, you know we we, we certainly uh, think they do. And you know, for any particular application, uh, you know, we're telling a story about how just revolutionary it could be um, if, for example, uh, you know, people in the warehouse. Uh, who are constantly being injured with repetitive stress injuries, mm. uh, low back injuries are a common one. Uh, how amazing it would be if they had a back uh, exoskeleton or exosuit uh, that supported them, reduced strain on the back, uh, improving their their experience, you know, reducing rates of injury, um, improving their productivity. Yeah. Um, so these products exist. Uh, generally they're, they're sold by startup companies. Uh, and you know, we're, we're looking for that hockey stick growth in, uh, adoption. Mm. And, uh, I think it's an exciting time because there are a lot of different groups, um, pursuing different applications of exoskeletons, um, that I, I think could be really exciting. Yeah. One kind of other application I've seen is either sort of in military areas or you know people doing very strenuous activity outside for long periods of time who who might benefit from a lot of the things you just described in terms of like reduced injury maybe better stamina things like that yeah absolutely um you know everyone's seen the movies i always pick on iron man <laughs> um because that suit is absolutely awesome and ridiculous at the same time <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> It's it's not happening, not in my lifetime. Uh, you know, we're not going to have uh, people with superhuman strength and mm -hmm. uh, explosive jets on their feet and all the <laughs> other things uh, yeah. that suit can do. But uh, it provides the inspiration. It provides the excitement about what could be, uh, and I think that's that's really important. Um, so we try to work at the intersection between the the sci-fi and the reality. Yeah. Um, you know, get people excited with the sci-fi and then hit them over the head with reality <laughs> <laughs> uh, and hopefully bridge the two. Mm -hmm. um, I think reality for uh, exoskeletons that reduce fatigue, improve strength, et cetera, is going to look uh, a little bit more precise uh, than, you know, a general purpose exoskeleton suit is typically mm. depicted. So rather than, you know, putting on a suit that enables you to do everything better, 
uh, you'll put on a suit or, or, you know, maybe it's not a full suit. Maybe it just assists one joint or two joints. Mm -hmm. And it, it assists you to do something very specific, uh, much better. And, uh, I think this is actually feasible with currently available technology. I was describing the, the back exoskeleton, Mm -hmm. uh, application earlier, like this really does work. And there's a lot of great evidence, uh, that proves that it works. Um, so, you know, does that suit enable people to lift boxes that weigh hundreds of pounds effortlessly? No, it reduces their uh, low back fatigue mm-hmm. by a significant percentage, uh, extending their ability to work without injuring themselves. Um, so not quite the stuff of, you know, superhero movies, but I think significant from a human quality of life and human productivity standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we see the same thing with just about every other joint in the body. Um, it is possible to significantly uh, assist uh, the human body in, in sort of precise ways. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to develop a whole sort of a different way of thinking and a whole marketplace of products around application specific assistance. Mm-hmm. So I, I liken it to, to, you know, power tools or hand tools, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, you, you, you got a Home Depot or Lowe's uh, and you can shop around for different screwdrivers and hammers uh, and they all have their own purpose. I think exoskeletons are more like that. I need my exoskeleton for lifting boxes. I need my exoskeleton for helping me hold a power drill above my head. I need my exoskeleton that helps me, you know, ascend stairs. Um, I imagine a closet full of exoskeletons. (laughs) Yeah, I like that idea. So two terms that come up a lot in this field, and I think you've mentioned them both already, are um, exoskeletons and exosuits. Um, for those of us not in the know, can you explain what the difference is between those two terms and what maybe their different benefits and applications are? Sure. And I love that you asked this question um, because historically, this is the sort of question that only, you know, PhDs working on exoskeletons would would argue about. I mean, this is the <laughs> kind of thing that I would argue about with my colleagues over beers, mm-hmm. uh, you know, late in the evening. but. Uh, we knew then, and we see now, uh, this sort of more public, uh, more general interest debate about what really is this technology and, and what can it do for people. Um, so, yeah, the the standardization of terms um, is is something that uh, organizations like ASTM the Standards Development Organization, Mm. um, actually put a lot of concerted effort into. There is a committee uh, that meets every month and argues about terminology uh, trying to establish consensus. Uh, It's fascinating stuff. Mm. Um, It happens in every industry, but it's particularly acute in our industry, uh, which is just so nascent. Um, So anyway, that that was a a long introduction (laughs) to the answer. But uh, I often use these terms um, interchangeably or perhaps even in a confusing way, um, because honestly, it's hard to be uh, really precise. Mm -hmm. I personally lean towards the term exoskeleton. I see it as more general. I see exosuit as being a little bit more specific in relating to devices which are primarily soft. Mm. and elastic um whereas exoskeletons tends to have this connotation in people's mind of something more rigid um you know like a like a crustacean yeah exactly (laughs) a crab or something um but even those have elastic elements in them and Mm. i i I think this you, you just wind up going down a rabbit hole of terminology that ultimately leads to more questions than answers so Often I just shorten it to exos. Um, yeah, maybe the world the can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I hope that was a good non-answer to your question. It was an excellent <laughs> non-answer. Yeah, yeah. I guess that kind of I was imagining the exosuits were more like 
almost like a an outfit that you wear, whereas an exoskeleton's a bit more a bit more rigid and a bit more external. Yeah, yeah, that that's the basic idea. And the dream of people developing exosuits um, is that you know you could you could basically wear something fabric like yeah. uh, that would enable uh, all of the things that we're trying to do with exoskeletons. Um, and I think that's amazing. But like, absolutely, we should we should uh, strive for that. Um, but at the same time, you have the basic laws of physics to contend <laughs> with. Yeah. Um, where you know. If for a given application, you need to apply a large force, um, then you need to choose materials uh, that are conducive to transmitting uh, large forces on the body. Tends to be more rigid. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, whether you go more soft or more rigid really depends on uh, the the application uh, and um, I try to encourage people to not take an ideological stand uh, in this debate um, because I just think it it really depends on what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And so we had uh, an audience question um, from Susan submitted on our website, which is quite interesting. Um, so Susan says, what do you see as the largest barriers to translating the exosuit advancements in human ambulation assistance to canine assistance? And how do you think these barriers can be overcome? Um, I love the question. And I, you know, I'm answering this from the perspective of someone who's not an expert at all in anything having to do with canines. Um, <laughs> but I'll say generally, uh, the world is full of questions like this. Can we assist canines? Can we assist felines? Can we assist older people? Can we assist kids? Mm. A plethora of uh, individuals and species uh, could benefit from this type of assistance. And I think the challenges, well, there are certainly many technical challenges. I think the challenges tend to be challenges related to the market Mm. for these products Um, because when you are trying to develop something uh, that is seen as relatively niche uh, and you're developing a technology that is seen as very advanced uh, you know becomes a question of money where does the money come from to support this research and development and you know as someone who's been working in this field uh, for for many years now, this is my daily uh, frustration. Um, you know, there are so many people who could benefit from this technology, but very few people who are currently using this technology. Mm. So we need to close that gap. And you know, at least with adult humans, uh, there's a lot of people out there with prosthetics and and orthotics. Um, So that is one of the reasons for my focus on that market, because it is the most established market. Um, There are dogs with prosthetics, uh, relatively smaller market. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So, but there are people who are deeply passionate about serving that market and are working on technology development um, in that area. And I think that's great. I think we as a society need to get better at funding niche uh, developments like mm-hmm. this. Um, because I think if if the arguments are purely economic in nature, uh, it's sort of hard to compete uh, with other uh, technologies um, that have the potential to to generate, you know, crazy profits. Mm. Um, but the motivation for us, you know, those of us that are doing the technology development, it's not purely economic. It's largely about helping people. It's largely about improving quality of life. Um, but, you know, as, as an entrepreneur or really anybody working in this field, you're sort of forced to uh, create, you know, an economic argument. Yeah. Um, which I think exists, uh, but uh, for certain populations, it's just so much harder. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, 
what's the economic argument for assisting uh, canines with exoskeletons? I mean, I haven't thought of, I've only been thinking about this for about a minute uh, and I'm not coming <laughs> yeah. up with one. I'm sure you could come up with one, um, but that is, is not trivial. Mm -hmm. And a little closer to home for me uh, is thinking about assisting human users um, with unique physiology, with unique mobility uh, challenges mm -hmm. um, where, you know, you're trying to solve problems that are, are N equals one, like one person in the whole world has this specific challenge yeah. and you're trying to develop technology to help them. Um, that, that's a hard economic argument. And so we've, with our company, you know, part of the way that we address this is by developing a platform, which is generalizable. It can be used in many different ways by many different people for many different purposes. So that for each individual who walks through the door, I don't need to build a whole new system. Uh, I can uh, utilize what I've, what I've already built previously. Mm -hmm. um, and so that enables us at Humotech to serve individuals in a more personalized way, um, to serve them better without extraordinary cost. Um, so that's my long-winded answer to the question. And, uh, you know, Susan from the website, uh, if you want to talk more about this, feel free to reach out to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the kind of the, the business case for, for uh, dog exosuits. And I guess the, the, the only, the obvious one to me is just as we were talking about exosuits or exoskeletons supporting people in their jobs, maybe service dogs like that work for the police or that um, help blind people. Mm. You know, if you, could, if you could make an exoskeleton that would allow them to work for longer hours and not be injured, that, that might be a, a business case for it. It makes sense to me. You know, uh, I just know this because of Instagram. I don't know why Instagram is showing me ads for... Uh therapies and pain methods for injured dogs but but i get them every so often mm. uh, so i'm i'm aware that um dogs experience all sorts of um musculoskeletal injuries i imagine uh, many similar modalities to what we see with humans yeah um so yeah no, no doubt that there's a need and a potential solution the big question is just is there is there a market yeah yeah, definitely. Josh, it's been fascinating chatting to you today. I've been talking to Josh Caputo, President and CEO at Humotech. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Claire. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Robot Talk, please do share the podcast, subscribe, and leave a review to let us know what you think. And make sure you check out our social media channels, to see a photo of Humotech's hip exoskeleton that Josh and I talked about. We're at Robot Talk Pod on all the socials. Next week, I'm talking to Virginia Ruiz Garate from Mondragon University, all about assistive robotics, mobility, and bio-inspired control. Until then, I've been Claire Asher, and this has been Robot Talk. Robot Talk is brought to you by the Hamlin Centre, Imperial College London. <laughs>